Okay, let's get started. Uh, hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Armagan al Haq. I work as the Managing Director with the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy at University of Waterloo. I would like to start with the territorial acknowledgement. The University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishani Beg and Haudini Sawney peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldiman Tract, the land granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work toward reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and is centralized within the Office of Indigenous Relations. It's an honor for me to introduce our speaker for today. Augusti Egia Alvarez is a reader, associate professor at the, electrical, at the Electronic and Electrical Engineering Department, University of Strathclyde. He is a member of the Power Electronics Drives and Energy Conversion Group. Also, he is the holder of a Royal Academy of Engineering Industrial Fellowship with Scottish Power. His uh, bio is quite long, but I would let him uh, to uh, do the honors uh, when it comes to the second part, as he has requested. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for our guest speaker for today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to this uh, talk. So, uh, oops, sorry. No. Yeah. So, uh, what we are going to talk today, or what I, I thought I have been invited to, to come uh, to, to Waterloo, no, thank you very much uh, to Zahar for, for inviting me. Uh, probably a lot of people here in the room that you don't know, uh, but the University of Strathclyde, we are, I will talk about the Strathclyde in a moment. But uh, Strathclyde and Waterloo, we have uh, what we call a special relationship. Um, we have been developing uh, PhD students together for, for, for uh, over a decade now, and we have been working in uh, UK, uh, Canada research projects. So it, for me, it's a real honor to be here today. And I thought, okay, you have been invited to give a talk to one of the most or the most important uh, electrical engineering or power institute in, in uh, North America, and I thought, wow, what I'm going to talk. Probably these guys know a lot. And I thought, probably what I should do is explain a little bit the, the problems that we have in the, in the GV network. Uh, one of the stories is that if you look how the, you know that we are going to this uh, net zero decarbonization, but uh, what I would argue is that the, there are some power networks, like for example, uh, Ireland. Ireland is a quite a small place that they, uh, they, if you read IEEE papers or whatever you read, they said, oh, there are a lot of issues in Ireland. Yes, there are a lot of issues in Ireland. But the story of the Irish network is that if you have a, a small synchronous machine, you can fix it. Uh, where the real problems are, are in, uh, or at least from my point of view, is uh, in networks that they are more or less isolated between uh, 60 to 80 gigawatts uh, we, or less. Uh, that we might be, uh, if, to name ones, I would talk about GB, Great Britain, I would talk about, uh, or I would say Texas, and I would say Australia. And what I thought is like, okay, let's, let's try to explain to our Canadian friends what's going on there from the point of view of trying to keep the lights on. Also, I tried to be a little bit funny, and I said, uh, no, keep calm and carry on, so keep the carbonizing and carry on. I don't know if this was funny or not, or uh, at least uh, attract the uh, people to come here. But this is what we are going to talk today. So, uh, just a little bit about uh, myself. Uh, so, uh, probably my uh, Scottish accent uh, confused you, but I'm originally from Spain. Uh, it, it was another joke. Uh, the, the story is that I graduated from, uh, from uh, the Technical University of Catalonia, that this is in Barcelona. And after that, I work for uh, the China Electric Power Research Institute, that is the largest uh, research institute in China dedicated to power, or in the world, in fact dedicated to power, to power networks. And when I was working there, I was working in the context of an European project. That is where uh, I met Sahar. That was a great experience uh, working with her. And after that, one thing uh, that is quite uncommon, if you look at uh, traditional academic careers, uh, mine is quite uncommon, in the fact that I did my postdoc in industry. Later on, I work as a converter control engineer. I was designing converter controllers for wind turbines for uh, Siemens Gamesa. It was called Siemens Wind Power at that moment. Now it's uh, Siemens Energy again. That is one of the largest uh, wind turbine manufacturers in the world. Later on, I became an academic. I uh, associate assistant professor uh, no, for the last six, uh, well, the other way around, no, uh, assistant associate professor for uh, uh, almost seven years now. 
And uh, a couple of years ago, I had the chance to uh, get a grant from the Royal Academy of Engineering uh, to work part-time for a Scottish Power, that this is the electric company in, a, in the south of Scotland, that basically I will show you in a, in a second, that we work on transmission and distribution. So basically, I'm always halfway between uh, industry and, and academia. That, uh, well, if you, somebody's interested, we can discuss once I finish the presentation. But if you look at my research topics, mainly I work on how renewables can help to stabilize the power network, and this is what I'm going to talk here today. Uh, I'm going working topics like grid forming, uh, uh, inertia emulation, frequency support, advanced stability controls. I work on the design of the next generation of power converters. So for example, these days, I'm working a lot with uh, Siemens Gamesa integrating uh, electrolyzers into wind turbines. Uh, also, I do a little bit of medium voltage power electronics uh, for, uh, for example, designing multi-port converters. Or uh, another topic that I have spent plenty of time uh, for the last two years, is try to understand how we can uh, provide black star from uh, renewable resources, or uh, we don't call it black star anymore. In uh, Britain, we call it restoration. So uh, something that it, it took me a grand part of my, of my time is trying to understand how we can do it. And the main reason of this is because if you look in Scotland, the, or if you look at the Scottish power network, the only way or the only uh, facility that we have available for doing black star in our area is a, a small 30 megawatt uh, um, hydro plant that basically this is not enough to power let's say the whole of Glasgow and Edinburgh that is something around uh, 5 million people so we have been working a lot on how we can use other resources we did a project on distributed resources so a small wind turbines as a, a small uh, uh, biomass uh, units, and now what we are doing is a big project on how we can do uh, black star from uh, offshore wind farms. That we have uh, something around in our area of Scottish power, we have something around six gigawatts of uh, wind farms coming in the next five years. Good. So, as I, I told you, I'm a, an a associate professor at, of the University of Strathclyde, that is in Glasgow. Just for you to know that this is in uh, Glasgow. Glasgow is in the north of the UK, in the in Scotland. Uh, this is the historical building, and this is our campus that is right in the city center. I would argue that, I mean, these pictures, I know that this is not AI generated, but they, they lie because it's sunny. It's never sunny <laughs> in, uh, in a Scotland. Probably you know that uh, this is uh, what the major part of people think. So it's very rainy and uh, quite depressing in winter, but probably you know that or you experience that here. So we're something around 22,000 students. We are what in continental Europe we call, or in continental Europe call a technical university, but in the UK we are just university. We are not a polytechnic school, whatever. In the UK, this is uh, just university. But our strength is uh, our engineering, and mainly what we do, 40% uh, of our research income comes or goes to uh, electric power engineering. Uh, or in, in specific power engineering, and we are something around 500 uh, people, researchers and PhD students, just to give you some, some numbers. And this is with my academic hat, now with my uh, industrial hat, and today, I'm, I'm really sorry, I mean, uh, is any of you familiar with uh, Great Britain Power Network? Just raise your hand. Oh, that's fantastic. So at the end of this uh, presentation, you will be experts in, uh, in the Great British Power Network. So. Basically, what happened in, in GB, in Great Britain, uh, I mean, I'm not saying the UK, because UK takes into account uh, Northern Ireland, and Northern Ireland for energy issues goes with the Republic of Ireland, so basically it's, uh, it's another story. Uh, this is why I'm talking about GB, because I'm only talking about uh, England, Wales, and Scotland. So what happened is, uh, probably you heard about a famous prime minister that we had during, uh, no, between the 79 and 91, Margaret Thatcher. Is uh, Margaret Thatcher famous to you? Okay, probably not for the good reasons. And probably this is one of the not very good reasons, but I, would, I will keep the energy policy and politics aside. So basically, in the UK, we had a vertically integrated company, all was owned by the government. From the generation to the retail, everything was government owned. And uh, at the end of the 80s, they started the privatization of the power network. And basically what happened is they decided to split the power network in three. We have what we have, this is the Scottish border. We have England and Wales, that is uh, managed by a company called National Grid, uh, electricity transmission. We have the central part of Scotland, 
that is managed by a Scottish power transmission, that is the company that I work. And later on, we have the north of Scotland, that traditionally was a very small area, and uh, nobody cares, that is managed for a Scottish hydro, uh, or SSE, we call it, a Scottish hydro and electric transmission. When they privatized it, basically they said, ah, come on, this is uh, north of Scotland, nobody cares. But now it's probably it's one of the most important in the UK, because they have plans to, I mean, they already have something around six gigawatts of, uh, uh, power of, uh, sort of uh, offshore wind power. Uh, there is a lot of HVDC links uh, coming there. So basically now it's becoming uh, more important than what it used to be. And just to explain to you, basically what this SP transmission, this called uh, Scottish Power, is there are three companies. There is the retail, there is the transmission, and later on there is the renewable generation. So basically what we are, or where I'm working, is what we call a Scottish Power Energy Networks. And we are in charge of the transmission in Scotland or the south of Scotland, uh, up to 100, from 400 to 132 kilovolts. And later on, we have the distribution network that is 132 below. Uh, and this is just to explain to you the, a little bit uh, where I'm coming from and the places uh, where I'm working. And this is a little bit the content of the presentation. So what I would like to discuss with you uh, is mainly the stability issues that we have in the power network in, in GB. I selected two cases. One was a partial blackout that happened in 2019, and the other one that I have selected some converter control oscillations that we had during June and July 2023, last year. Uh, and what I would like is explain a little bit what we have experienced and try to understand the solutions that we try to put in place. And uh, spoiler alert, what we are going to see is that what we believe that was a solution four years ago, it's very unlikely, especially because this is recorded, I said very unlikely, that it's going to be a solution for the future. But let's talk about this a little bit. And later on, what we are going to do is focus in two main aspects of this stability. One is about the inertia, that is something to do with the frequency and power balancing. And later on, we are going to focus on, uh, on the show circuit level that uh, has something to do more, more, more related with the voltage stability. So I, I think that you, you, you probably you are tired of seeing uh, slides like this, but basically what I want to highlight here is that the power network is changing, and what we are doing is we are installing uh, a lot of renewable power, we are installing a lot of interconnectors, and all this is interfaced with power electronics, power electronic converters, PSC, put the name that you want on, 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 on that. And one of the things that, I mean, uh, as, as, as I told you before, I'm a, I'm a power electronic engineer that works with power networks. I'm saying that because uh, especially 2018, 2020, 2016, in the UK there was a feeling, if you talk to the people from the electric networks, they, it was the feeling that the power electronics were not working. And it's like, wait, power electronics is doing what your grid code says that power electronics should do. So. And uh, th th this is something that we, we have to, to keep in mind. So basically, I don't know what's the, what's the music that uh, you can hear uh, in, in Canada, but in the UK for a while was, oh, power electronics doesn't work, power electronics doesn't work. No, we have to uh, cap the number of wind turbines, we have to cap the number of HVDC links. But in fact, this is not the story. The story, at least for me as a power electronic control engineer, what happened is that these power electronics that we had installed in our system were doing very, very limited work. So basically they were just injecting active power and providing some voltage support if required. And this is something that is important because power electronics will be soon in charge of the operation of the network. I mean, there is these words of grid following and grid forming that I'm a little bit sick and tired. Uh, I don't know if any one of you is studying grid forming and grid following, but uh, uh, I have been in ENZOE, that is the European regulator, I have been in SIGRE, uh, I have been in uh, UK working groups on grid forming, and my bills are paid thanks to grid forming. But I'm a little bit tired of this, because in fact, it's not, the, it, it, or the, 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 what we are discussing here is not if you need grid forming or not. What we are discussing here is who is going to be in charge of the operation and control of the power network. And this is something that for me is important. What electric companies, what or uh, network operators and network owners should realize, and at least in the UK this is happening, I think that in the Canada you are a little bit more advanced on this, you had uh, HVDC links for, for longer than us. Uh, the story for me is that we have, these people need to understand that the network is changing or what's connected to the network is changing, and they need to understand 
how these new devices that we are connecting behave, and they need to understand how the network should be operated with these devices, that compared to a standard synchronous machine is going to be a little bit different. So for, for me, the problem is not grid forming or following. This is a subset of problem. For me, the, the, the story is how we can give the control of uh, the power network from the synchronous machines to the power converters, ensuring resiliency, resili reliability in a low cost. And this is, for me, what's, what's important, what's the important bit of the story. So here what I put is a little bit uh, some headlines of the, of, the, of the different newspapers and different, different British media uh, highlighting several things when several, thing, well, no, when several events happened. So let's start from the left. So in August 2019, there was a partial blackout in GB. I'm going to talk uh, about this in a, in a moment, why this happens. And only one million customers lost power. And this was a drama, mainly because some of the trains, they had a protection that when the frequency went down below 49 hertz, the train disconnected. In, the, in, in GB trains, or uh, the major part of trains in GB, they are connected to 25 kilovolts AC. And basically, the train disconnected. And what happened is that nobody thought that the frequency, or the, the people, or the person who designed the train never thought that the frequency could go lower than 49. And basically, there was a condition that said, oh, if the frequency goes lower than 49, stop the train, and this is the important part, somebody should manually restart the train. So basically, what this means is that somebody had to go in the middle of the, no, the, the English countryside, that is very nice, with a laptop, go into the train, and boom, reset, reset, the, reset the, the train. And this is why people talk about the transport chaos across England and Wales. Because something so stupid that somebody put a protection on a train in good faith, and at the end, the effect was catastrophic. Well, catastrophic, what this means is that probably had to stay two or three hours on that train before it was reset. It. So, and after that, people started to talk about uh, that the UK energy resili resiliency was not, uh, was not getting any better. And uh, this, for example, uh, put some stress in the government to, st to start a new department that it's called Department for uh, Net Zero and uh, uh, Energy uh, uh, Department Desnes, Department for uh, Energy Resiliency and Net Zero. So it's something that became very important and very high up in the agenda. And what I am talking, I'm going to talk today, is uh, what the National Grid, that is, uh, or the ESO, National Grid ESO, that is our operator, the decision that they took. To, to, make it, to make it more resilient and reliable. And we are going to analyze how this impacted. Apart from that, okay, some other headlines that, okay, that, just keep that one, that traffic lights went off. This is in Glasgow. So Glasgow is the largest city in Scotland. And this is our uh, icon. This is the Duke of Wellington with a cone. So this is the, the, the symbol of Glasgow. So it says that the traffic lights went off across the, 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 the city. Can I ask you, why do you think that this happened? Any, any clue? Okay, somebody guess. Or we have, I see that we have six people online. Any, any clue, why do you think that the traffic lights can go off? And I'm here talking about the stability. No? Shy? Okay, you will get the answer in a couple of slides. Oh, sorry. Is, frequ is, is, is frequency related, but it's not because there was a power mismatch. You are, you are, you are, you are almost there. Okay, I, I will tell you now. It's due to a control interaction. I will, I will show you the plots in a moment. And basically, as I knew that I was coming to university uh, and I'm here talking about problems, I asked ChatGPT to, to do a picture of, uh, of the, no, the, the people or the power engineers that we are going to save the world, no, ensuring resiliency and reliability. And this is what ChatGPT gave me. I don't know why there is this green guy on the right, but this is the way that you should look at yourself, like a superhero that is going to make possible that we do the energy transition. And as good superheroes that we are, we have real problems. And what I have done here is introduce you a little bit uh, the uh, GP power network. So at this moment, we are something around uh, 80 gigawatts of power. Uh, we have uh, the goal to achieve net zero by 2050, and we are going to achieve net zero for some days in 2035. 
net zero in the UK context means solar, wind, hydro, and nuclear. And there is a controversy if nuclear should be included or not. I'll keep this apart. This is our definition of net zero. To give you some rough numbers, uh, these days, wind power is something around 29% of the UK total electricity generation. And our record was last year that uh, on the 4th of January 2023, it was a very, 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 very windy day. We achieved something around 87.6% of the electricity generated using net zero. Especially considering that in GB, the days of more electricity demand, they are in winter. So this is quite a lot. Uh, and what happened then is that around 20, I mean, after this 9th of August event, 2029, uh, the, the government and the regulator of GEM, uh, the Office for Gas and Electricity, said to the, said to the, to the, to the power industry, said, guys, you have to do something, otherwise we are going to have a blackout. And just to give you an idea, the, the first thing that uh, National Grid, or sorry, yeah, National Grid ESO did is this study. And basically said, no, we have to look at our network or the GB network, and we have determined that in the next 10 years, this, I'm talking about 2020, this, when this was published, we have determined that basically we have some areas in our network that we will have a lot of issues. And in fact, what they said is like a small, that is the yellow, but I don't see a lot of yellow here. Uh, they said uh, medium, and later on they said large growth in stability needs. And this is what they, they picture. And later on what they said is, like, well, but later on we have a Scotland that is a little bit worse than large growth in stability needs. Basically what means is that we are in big trouble. And they said what we need is a special plan for, 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 for a Scotland. And just to explain a little bit where this comes from, these numbers are coming from, in fact, the way that National Grid ESO assessed the stability of the network is looking at the number of converters connected. So here in the left, you can see the, the, the map where you can see the stability issues. In the middle, you can see the penetration of wind. And here on the right, what you can see is the HVDC links. In fact, these HVDC links that you can see here, this is how the, the situation would look like in 2035. Sorry, I didn't put it, but this is 2035. Uh, if you look at that, you can see that in Scotland, we have a lot of HVDC, we have a lot of wind, and this is why this is in, 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 a, in, a, in a pink and purple. We have problems, and what I'm going to show you is that the problems that these guys or uh, the people from National Grid thought that we were going to have in 2030, we already have them. I will show you some of them. Converter control interactions, this is the, the new fancy topic that we are, our network is suffering. And even just for a, a short remark, if you look at this map, so basically what happens in GB, uh, probably you don't have this problem in Canada, but in GB, it's absolutely impossible to build a 400 kV or above, or even 200 uh, kV uh, or above power transmission line. And basically what the regulator has decided and the government they have decided is that the way that we are going to evacuate all this renewable power in Scotland to the south and mainly probably try to feed London is not through AC standard lines. What we are going to do is HVDC lines across the sea. And this is why we have this, that this is an operation, we call it the Western Link. And later on, what we have is uh, it, has been, uh, it has been announced, we are going to have what we call the Eastern Link. That is going to be, uh, in this case, this is LCC, this is going to be VSC. But the story is that the Eastern Link is not going to be a link, it's going to be four links of eight gigawatts. So, and this is just to evacuate power from Scotland down to south without crossing the land because people don't want to see towers. So, massive, massive challenges. So just imagine, in this area here in the north of Scotland, there is less than half a million people. We, are, we have something around, at this moment, nine gigawatts of wind with topping 15 gigawatts of wind in the upcoming 10 years. And we are going to have eight gigawatts of uh, HVDC links uh, evacuating power to the south, plus the HVDC links going to Norway, plus the HVDC links going to the, to, the, to the Scottish Isles. So it's a lot of power electronics for a very, 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 very small uh, 
uh, load or in that network. Okay, and this is, I promise, is the last time that I, I'm going to show them up. So just to show you how the problem is getting complicated is because we have, or, or, okay, uh, from my point of view, uh, we are recording that. My, the, one of the problems that we are having here is that we are operating a network that is uh, fragmented. So basically we have the three transmission owners, but at the same time, we have nine distribution owners. And at the same time, we have what we call the ESO, that is the energy system operator that was called formerly National Grid, and we have the regulator that is called Ofgem. So the only thing that I want to highlight in this slide is that coordinate all these people, it's getting a little bit of an nightmare. Uh, the other thing that I, I wanted to highlight, and I was talking about when uh, the vertically integrated company was split, it, is that everything was privatized. Uh, this is not like this anymore. The ESO, usually we call it National Grid, uh, but because this company and this company were together and it was called National Grid, later on it was called National Grid ESO, the energy or electricity system operator. This is going to public, back to public hands. This is going to be a, a department or a, will depend on the department of the, of the government. And one, there are a lot of reasons that uh, we can discuss for a while, but one of the reasons was that people from the regulator, from Ofgem, from the Office of the Gas and Electricity, uh, they detected that the ESO was you know, deviating a little bit from their uh, statutory engineering requirements. And basically, uh, six years ago, they fired a massive amount of engineers because engineers are expensive, but probably engineers are required to operate the network. And when the government saw that, they said, let's put them back in. So basically now, uh, this is going to be owned by the government again. So just to show you how close to the disaster we were, this is the 9th of August event. At this particular moment, it was an afternoon, an August uh, afternoon, there was a storm and uh, there was a lightning strike in one of the lines in uh, the Yorkshire area. And a lightning strike is something like, boom, happens, you have a fall, you isolate, uh, no, uh, there is a protection, detects, isolate it, back, uh, no, back to work again. But what happened that day is something a little bit more interesting, is that basically due to this problem or this uh, lightning strike, uh, see, uh, combined cycle uh, uh, turbine tripped and follow the gas, okay, I mean, we can discuss a little bit about the seconds because more or less the same. Follow that, an uh, offshore wind farm tripped. The particularity is that this offshore wind farm was under testing. So it, they, they were trying to obtain the final certificate to be connected. And basically this offshore wind farm had no regulatory obligations. That is something interesting. Uh, that this incident happened when this wind farm was under testing for two weeks to get the final approval from the government. So what happened is the combined cycle tripped because uh, there was uh, something that it was not working right in the control. And later on, the wind farm tripped because at that moment they only had uh, two ca export cables co commissioned instead of, instead of, uh, instead of uh, three. And there was a weak network and the wind farm started to resonate due to a weak network. Uh, and later on, the frequency started to go down, 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 down. And what happened is the other two units of the gas uh, plant tripped and the frequency reached an idea of 48.8. And at that moment, the system operator, there is an automatic uh, LFDD, low frequency demand disconnection, and they said, boom, we disconnect certain customers from that. And this is when the partial blackout occurred. Things that went wrong, okay, uh, the wind farm, uh, I mean, it was not prepared for weak networks. The gas turbine probably needed a little bit more, wo uh, more work. Uh, the LFDD disconnected 1.2 gigas of power. So some of these customers were sensitive, no, one of those uh, sensitive customers that shouldn't disconnect like railway. And this happened. And basically later on, there was a massive revision of that. Another incident is this. This happened uh, 7th July, 2023. No, this is uh, almost uh, one year ago. Uh, the, all in a sudden, we started to see some oscillations occurring in the system. And at the same time the, all this was happening, uh, some HVC links and a nuclear power station start to trip. So basically the frequency that is, uh, what signal is that uh, here? The frequency, you can see that this starts to, 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 to drop. And basically what happens is that there was one, two, three, and four events. And it's like, wow. And this event disconnect an HVDC link and a nuclear power station. So this is something that is happening already. And this was 
because they commission, uh, they were commissioning a new wind farm. I cannot say names, I cannot say locations. And basically, uh, I mean, they go there with the default converter parameters, boom, zing, zing, zing. This happens at night. Basically, the demand was low and the voltage was high. So basically, there was low, lower damping into the system. Converter control oscillation. So what happened in 2020 is that the ESO, the electric system operator, said, as we are a private company and we like to do, no, take the advantage, uh, sorry, I, I mean, uh, uh, okay, how I say that? Make, um, create markets for, uh, for uh, our stakeholders and uh, no, the different partners involved in the, in, the, in the story. The ESO, instead of changing or pushing the grid code changes because the grid code is a statutory, what they did is like, wait a sec, we are going to create an a stability market. And it's like, what an stability market is? Can you sell poles and zeros? Apparently, yes. And what happened is that in 2020, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit sarcastic, so sorry. Uh, you will see why in some slides. So what, what happened was that at that time, ESO was on the mindset, oh, converters are bad. What we need is things that behave like a synchronous machine. And even they were talking about virtual synchronous machines and the way that we should control the converters. That is a flavor of grid forming. Even we call it, if you, we have a grid code on, on, on uh, we have a grid code on grid forming converters in the UK, and we call it GBGF, grid, uh, Great Britain Grid Forming, because at that moment, somebody said that what we need is a virtual synchronous machine, nothing to do with fancy, I mean, anyway, I stop here. So basically what happened is the ESO said, if you want to increase stability, what you need is full current, and what you need is inertia. And they said, if you provide short circuit level and you provide inertia, we are going to pay you. And this is what they did. So basically, they put in practice or they put in place a market that started in 2020. And in fact, the first units were not connected until 2023. And we are not going to have all of the units until 2026. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that are these services the right ones? Is this thing of the full current what we need? And is inertia what we need to keep our system? And probably in this span of three years and a half, what we have learned is that probably what we don't need is that. Because basically what happens is we have been awarding these contracts to synchronous condensers. And now people are building synchronous condensers because then they're going to be rewarded. But the problem is we are having these units connecting to the network and we're having stability issues. So probably the solution was not uh, the, the right one. If you want to go no more, just uh, Google uh, ESO oper Operability Strategy Report, and uh, you will find all this information of what uh, Great Britain is doing. And now let's continue with another dose of sarcasm. Uh, this is just a, a quick reminder why inertia is important in standard power networks. I base this in a report of NREL that is very, very good. So as you know from Power Systems 101, you need to balance demand and generation. So if you have a very big imbalance and the worst ones and so it's when you have more uh, demand and generation, what's going to happen is that the frequency will start to reduce. And the story there is that you have the primary control or the primary frequency response that basically is the one that will rectify the command of the, of the power station to start to produce more power. And the story is that in traditional power networks, this happens or this, is a, this takes some time, because if you have a hydropower station, you have a valve that you have to open. If you have a gas turbine, you have to open the valve and allow more, ga more gas to the turbine. Uh, if you have a nuclear, you cannot do anything. Or uh, I mean, French probably they can do something, but in, in, in general, uh, nuclear doesn't work on primary. Uh, the story is, while you are open the tap or the valve that will allow the, the, the power to flow, the, the power imbalance is there. And basically what happens in a standard power system is that you have the inertia that is this energy stored in the rotating mass of the, of the synchronous machines that delivers this power to the, to the, to the, to the network as, as uh, no, trying to, 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 to stabilize the network. So basically inertia is something, and this is my definition, that saves your arse while you are still opening the valve of your, of your, of your power stations. No? The, the question here is, if you have a power electronic converter, you, for example, you have a battery, we have 30 gigawatts of batteries in queue in Great Britain. If you have 
something that can provide power fast, why do you need inertia? This is one question that I want to put on the table. So, and even there is something that is quite interesting because uh, well, we have been operating microgrids for ages. No? We have uh, Professor Cañizares here that uh, he, he knows a lot about that. So the story there is that when they publish the reports, and now the mindset is changing, but two, three, four years ago, what they were saying, okay, this is the standard converter control in a, in a synchronous machine, and what you can do in a converter is this. You cannot go very far with a converter because basically there's this discussion if inertia is natural or is not natural. And some of the studies that we did in uh, Strathclyde and other universities uh, uh, is that, well, probably there is a moment that we don't really care at all if uh, this is very instantaneous or natural or it happens. I mean, what I'm trying to say here is that I think that where we are heading is that if you have the power, just put the power into the system and that's it. Uh, also, I mean, I will go there in a moment, is the importance of the frequency and what frequency means. So this is, uh, I think that, uh, yeah, I'm running a little bit behind. But what I want to see with uh, this slide is that what some people said is that, well, probably you should make the, the, the renewable power be part of this uh, uh, inertia thing. No? And basically, the, 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 the renewable units should be able to provide the uh, additional power when the, there is a, a particular rock off. And this is something that we have been studying for a while, and this is something that we can do. There is a, the first paper on inertia emulation on wind turbines. When do you think that it was published? When do you think that the first paper about wind turbine, uh, so inertia emulation using wind turbines was published? Any guess? Sorry? <laughs> Well, in fact, it's from 2007. So what I'm trying to say is that we know that uh, this was, uh, was, was possible to do. And if you look a little bit at the, at, the, at the challenges that we were trying to solve, and we look at the, at the work that we have done. So basically, this is a study that we did uh, at Strathclyde. And basically, what we saw is uh, four years ago, this was published. Uh, I will share the slides, so, uh, and also it is going to be recorded. So I, I have put the papers that all this is based here. Uh, so the, the, the story there is uh, when we look at this four years ago, what we saw that the problems was the con containing the frequency within the statutory limits, the measurement of the frequency and the rock off, the security of the rock off, uh, loss of mains uh, relays and the regional variation. So this is what we, what we thought that was a problem regarding the, the frequency. So one is that basically our limits, as we are reducing inertia, our limits is going to be harder to keep them. But OK, this is what, what we thought. Also, how we measure this, especially in fissure measurements, this is something that we have to consider how we are going to, to make it work. Also, I don't know if you are using them here. In Britain, we use the loss of main protections. So basically, what this, we have a set of relays in Britain that they monitor the frequency, and, uh, or they, mot they monitor the change of rate of frequency. And this is above 0 0.25 hertz. They tripped, because this means that we have lost the network. I don't know how, how you do that in Canada, but this is how we do it in Britain. And later on, one thing that we have observed is that the behavior of the inertia, or what we think is inertia in Scotland, for example, has nothing to do with uh, going on uh, in uh, Exeter. So basically, we start to see the behavior of the regional inertia. And more other things that we can discuss later on if you are interested. But what I'm trying to say here in the next slide, flash forward four or five years after we did this study and National Grid started to, to, to talk about we should provide inertia, what happens is, first one, this year we changed the minimum inertia of our system from 140 uh, gigajoules to 120 gigajoules because we think that we thought, well, we saw that we can go lower and there is no problem. Converter limits, there is a lot of discussion that probably now the cost to keep the, the system between the limits is going to be very expensive. And in fact, we have the feeling that for a standard power stations, except a particular list, I will talk about this in a moment, uh, and for the renewal power and for the major part of the loads, frequency limits shouldn't be an issue. This is a, a line of thought that is uh, emerging. And it's likely that in the next five years, we are going to change our frequency limits. Also, just to show you, we have loss of mains protection. That basically is the way that we detect that the frequency is uh, drifting or that the network is disconnected. So basically, we change it from 0 0.25, this is quite tight, to 0 0.5. And we are about to change it to 1 hertz per second. 
So what I'm trying to say is that this thing of the rock off that uh, five years ago for us was absolutely important. Now we, we saw that, oh, well, if uh, you have one hertz per second, nothing happens. And you can continue operating the network. It does happen with a selected list of a standard old power stations that the shaft, if you have these changes, the shaft can resonate and, uh, well, can, can be damaged. So these ones, these power stations, they have been kept at 0 0.125. to Measurements, probably is not a problem. Uh, I mean, uh, there are a lot of uh, clever things, Kalman filters and uh, clever people doing a lot of clever stuff to measure frequency, whatever frequency means. Uh, it's another discussion for another day. And also, the other thing that we are trying to understand is how we can operate what we call regional inertia. So basically, uh, how we need to, for example, understand what kind of provision we need in every part of the country, uh, if this should be converter provided to single machine provided, and how we should do it. So this is something that uh, is happening. So what I'm trying to do with, uh, with this is trying to tell you, is what I'm trying to do with that is trying to tell you that what we thought that the stability problem was, especially regarding the frequency, has changed a lot in the, in the past four years. And even in the ESO, that it was like the, the uh, all mindset synchronous machine, they are, they are changing, and they are changing not because, I mean, I do understand that their job is to keep the lights on, and keeping the lights on is a lot of responsibility. And I do understand that you want to stick what, what you know, but there is a moment that, that they are accepting that they, they have to change. And for example, through this exercise of providing stability services, they realize that, oh, four years ago, we thought that inertia was a problem, because they saw, they saw the, you know, the frequency going as low as 48.8. But what we have seen uh, is that, the, the, that we have a converter control interaction. And this is probably the problem that is now the, on, the, on, the, on the list. By the way, I didn't explain that. Uh, traffic lights. Uh, so the traffic lights in Glasgow disconnected because there was a clever guy that is the guy who designed it and says, I'm going to find a cheap way to synchronize the traffic lights across, uh, across Glasgow. And the cheap way to synchronize the traffic lights that the guy found, or, uh, or the woman, the engineer that working on that, is that traffic lights are going to be synchronized when the voltage that it's feeding the traffic light crosses zero. So this is like a clock synchronization. What happened was, when the converter control oscillation started, we had eight, eight, eight hertz oscillation. And, uh, and the traffic lights detected that there was something wrong with the zero crossing and they disconnected. So what I'm trying to say is that what the public perceived was that the traffic lights went off for one hour until somebody reset, resetted them. But as engineers, I show you that the frequency went low very, very rapid. And our, the frequency, sorry, the frequency started to oscillate. And this had a chain effect of uh, HVDC links and power stations disconnected. So what I'm trying to say is that something that the people perceive like, oh, the traffic lights are off, in reality is, oh, we were uh, not very far away of uh, potential blackout. So j just to show you where, where, where we were. And the last thing that I would like to discuss with here with you today, I, I will go a little bit fast, so I apologize. If you are interested, we can discuss later on. I would like to allow 10 minutes to discuss. It's the other aspect. So the stability pathfinder, when they said, we have to provide the stability services, one was focused on inertia. The other one was focused on fault current. Why fault current? The explanation of the thing or why they were interested in fault current is because in a standard power networks, the way that we have to assess among others, and probably I would say mainly uh, voltage stability, is what, or we can discuss if it's voltage or not, but anyway, I will call it voltage, is through the, what we call the short circuit level. The short circuit level is calculated from the amount of current that is flowing from uh, uh, point where we have the fault and the generators. So basically, the larger the current, the better, because basically what this means is that the impedance of the generator is smaller, and this means that, for example, we can transfer active power uh, in, a, in a nice linear way. For example, this uh, red and uh, yellow, this is something quite a strong network, and the blue one is a weak network. So basically, this is nice and linear, this is not. So traditionally, what we have said is that the impedance of the generator will determine the stability of the network. And this is the, 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 the SCR or, or the way that we, okay, this is the, what's behind the SCR, the way that we calculate it. 
But the problem that we have, especially when we are doing these uh, full current analysis, uh, or sorry, we are using this kind of uh, inferring a stability analysis from full current, is that if you have a power converter, the power converter is current is limited to 1.1. So basically, if you try to do the calculation of the stability, you will see that always we are unstable. Uh, sorry, or the, always the stability of the neighbor is compromised. And this is not true. And I will skip this. So basically, this is a certain, certain uh, equivalence that people have suggested. But the problem that we have is that if you use all these equivalents, you cannot take into account the effect of the power electronics converter. And in fact, what you have to do, I uh, will do this a little bit faster. What you have to do is try to calculate or try to take into account the effect of the converter control, the small signal, the effect of the small signal converter control when you calculate the, small, the short circuit ratio. And this is something that from Strathclyde, this is a research that I led with uh, the power industry. We try to find an equivalent. This is a paper published. Uh, you have the reference in the previous slide. In this, uh, it was a power delivery. Uh, that basically what we try to do is define a new short circuit ratio metric, metric, uh, metric. I will not talk how to calculate it, but uh, people suggest a lot of metrics. The, the, the important thing about ours is that when we are talking about in a passive network matches with the SCR, and the other important thing is that can take into account of the defect of the grid forming converters. And here what we have is, uh, for those who are familiar with, this is a grid following converter, this is a grid forming converter. And what we did is basically compare our metric that we call GSIM compared to the other ones. And basically what happens is uh, we are going to stick to this one, that basically one means that we have both converters connected, and two is when we only have one, because it's half of the power, this is why this is two. So basically what happens is that when we have a grid following converter connected, what the usual index says is that the SCR is the same, but the other, what the other index says is that you have a certain uh, negative effect on stability. And basically what we have calculated with the GSIM is that probably the effect is a little bit larger. But on the contrary, when you have a grid forming converter connected, what we can see is that the usual index, like the SCR or even the new proposed, they take into account the same effect but we know that grid forming has a positive effect on stability. Otherwise, people would not talk about this. The issue that we had is that we couldn't quantify it. So basically, what, this is why we look at GSIM, uh, where we created GSIM, that basically what we saw is uh, find a way to quantify the positive impact of power converters into the SCR or the SCR equivalent uh, stability analysis. And one other thing that we saw is that, for example, if you mix grid forming and grid following, the you can improve the original short circuit ratio. And as I said, this is for uh, a small signal voltage, um, a small signal voltage uh, stability, or this is the context that we should understand. Once the power converter saturates, this is another story. But to understand how the, our network could be stabilized in normal operation, this is why this is used for. Also, in Britain, in fact, there were two groups working on this. It was us working with uh, Siemens, Gamesa, and uh, Scottish Power, and there was another group working with uh, National Grid and Imperial College, and they came also with, uh, with another index, and uh, we are very good friends, but we believe that our is better. I uh, know, and uh, okay, uh, jokes aside, basically what, what's important here is that we are trying to push uh, the power industry to make sure that they understand that they have to change the way that they assess the stability. If, you use, if they use mine or ours or they use the, the other, probably don't really care. Important thing is, uh, is that uh, they change the way that they calculate it. And later on here, I will share the slides with you. This is a little bit of an example for an offshore wind farm and how you do that. But I will skip these two slides. And later on, if you have interest at the end of the presentation, we can discuss it. Because I'm interested in knowing your thoughts and uh, listening to your questions. So basically, as a summary of my presentation, is uh, I think that at least in GP, we are at the point that the transmission owners, that they are the owners of the, of the 400 and 230 kV network, and the network system operator, and the regulator, they are understanding that the stability is important, and also they are understanding that we have to move forward from the way that we have operated the network. And, and, and for example, this stability pathfinder has been a very important, important uh, learning exercise, because at the very beginning, they thought that adding inertia and adding full current this will be north. But now they have seen that probably these two things might not be exactly what they need, and they have to move and trying to understand how these converters can, can do. I, I would argue that this is a, 
a long way, and uh, it's very likely that in the way we are going to have partial blackouts or national blackouts. I hope not, but I think that this, uh, this is uh, likely that we, for the next years we are going to have our uh, resiliency affected. But I think that this is the, the part of this uh, very exciting adventure that basically as you are students yeah, you know, or, or researchers or academics, we are working uh, together to, to solve. And that's me. Thank you very much. I see that we have uh, 10 minutes for questions. I'm happy to stay here after that if somebody would like to discuss a little bit further. Thank you, Augusti. Thank you so much. Uh, just a quick reminder before we dive into the Q&A session, my boss, Professor Claudio Canizares, Executive Director Wise, has a few comments to make. And right after his comments, we will dive into the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Amugan. Can you hear me? Oh, thank you. We can hear you. Thank you, Agusi. A very interesting presentation. Thank, thanks for, for taking the time to, to speaking to us and being part of this initiative. Public lectures are wise. I greatly appreciate it. I just wanted to uh, uh, raise a couple of issues. You, you've, I really enjoyed your presentation, very, very much to the point and, and very, very relevant. Uh, you raised a couple of issues, which is regarding the frequency control and the yep. uh, virtual inertia, which I fully agree with. My, for microgrids, we have had this problem of low inertia forever, and it was never a problem with fast response. So you made a very good point. Now, something that has happened in, in, in other jurisdictions, uh, PJM, PJM in particular, they have divided the frequency control in two parts, fast response and slow response, and they have a market for fast response. They have regulation A, regulation D uh, signals. So they are not requiring virtual inertia, but they are requiring fast response. So that's something that I presume uh, is being considered in, in, uh, in, uh, in the UK. It, and I wonder. The other issue that you mentioned is the issue of short circuit ratio, very well, very well made. We have known in voltage stability, which was my area of research for many years, that short circuit ratio is not, is, is not a, uh, equivalent to voltage stability. In fact, you, have, you might have very large short circuit ratios and still have a collapse. So that's another very good point. However, there are two issues with which you mentioned with, uh, with, uh, with these converter controls. One is the issue that uh, they don't have enough uh, uh, short circuit current, so that can create protection problems if you don't have yeah. proper protection. And the other issue is the, that you also mentioned is resonance, which is fairly unique and, and needs to be addressed. You, you, you mentioned that needs, you need retuning and be careful with that, but those are issues which are not the same and, and need to be addressing all of these issues. Could you comment, please? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much. So uh, I, 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 now I feel that this was, a, this was a trap. So if I knew that uh, Claudio was, uh, was here listening, I would go very careful. No, no, thank you very much for, for being here. For me, it's an honor, Claudio, that you were here. So the first one, it's an interesting one, regarding the protections. So what's true is that power converters, they have a, a, a limited current uh, or current capability. In fact, is uh, traditionally designed for no more than 1.1, 1.2. And funny enough, this is one of the things that, for example, from the Strathclyde, together with the uh, HVDC Center and SSC, we have been looking at. So basically, I, I acknowledge that in some areas of the country, we will need to think about what kind of electrical protection we need to install. And for example, from our side, we have been uh, discussing and we have been working with OEMs to design new distant protections for, let's say, converter dominating networks. And this is something that we have to do. Uh, but I think that the real problem comes when we are talking about, uh, let's say, I, I don't know how you do this in Canada, but here we have, uh, in the GV, we are using uh, uh, distant relays or, uh, or uh, okay, other ones as a, as a primary, but later on we have the, let's say, full current, or a maximum full current uh, as a backup. And this is probably where people started to discuss this. And I think that, yes, I should acknowledge that in some areas of the country this is going to be a problem because of the penetration of converters. But also I would like to bring you to the attention and to the other side of the story is because in some areas that, for example, in Scotland, we have some uh, places that we have wind farms, uh, we have statcoms, we have uh, more statcoms than the road. And there is a moment that we have a lot of power electronics that, for example, uh, if we consider that we have tidal and we have uh, offshore wind and onshore wind, probably they are not expected to work all at the same time. And some of them, like for example, the statcoms, they might be idling. And what we have seen is that in some areas of the countries that we have a lot of power converters, we are going to have more full current than the, the one that we were expecting. 
uh, and this is a another aspect, but yeah, fully agree that we need to keep working on the, the electric protection and the way that we design it, because at the end of the day, it's a, it's a vital part of the, of the network. And take into account that in some places it's going to decrease and in some places it's going to increase. And so, sorry, Claudio, what was the other point? The issue of resonance and the issue of uh, whether the UK is considering this as pleading of the frequency control. Yeah, so the, the issue of the, of the resonance is, okay, uh, sadly, it's quite niche, but in Scotland it's happening <laughs> almost every month. So it's something that uh, uh, we, 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 we have seen happening very, very often. And the problem of the, this kind of resonance is, is that you cannot hide them. So for example, at the University of Strathclyde, we have a couple of PMUs connected to the 400 voltage, to the low voltage side. And this is uh, something that we can see. We know that this is something that is quite niche, but what we believe that this opens is a, is a, is a, is a new discussion because at the end of the day, a lot of these resonance issues, at the level that we are now, you can solve it changing the tuning of your converter. And a lot of times what happens is that a particular guy from a particular company goes there with a default setting of the power converters and says, no, no, I switch it on. And, and, and basically they, they didn't think about uh, how, how to do that. So what I'm trying to say here is that what I believe that we are going to see in the upcoming years is a, a new grid code disposition or a, a new t annex to the grid code connection that is going to say, okay, to, in order to avoid resonances, probably you should take a look at the way that you tune your power converter. So, uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, this is something that we have seen happening quite often in, uh, in our network, especially in summer. So especially on Sunday nights in summertime, that is when the demand is the, the lowest in the network. Thanks. And last, last question, which I, I still haven't heard an answer for, is the splitting of the frequency regulation like they, they do in PJM? There's a market for that, in fact. Yeah. Is that what you consider in the UK? Uh, what, 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 sorry, what, what regulation? The, in the PJM has proposed or is using an approach in which batteries are providing fast frequency regulation. They get a different signal or regulation, frequency regulation than the normal plants. Well, and they, like, so they have two signals. They are not talking about virtual inertia, but as what you were saying. Yes, yes, yes. The fast resources for fast frequency. Regulation. Well, in fact, in the UK, uh, I mean, now because we had the stability pathfinder and we have a grid forming grid code, we are talking about inertia from one side. Uh, and from the other, we are talking, as you said, as, as two index. So basically, the, the fast, fast frequency used to be called fast frequency re, re, uh, response, that is not calling this way anymore. Uh, and later on, we have, let's say, the more, more uh, slower ones. But it's, it's an approach that, let's say, in the UK, it's, it's already in place. Uh, later on, you can discuss how many units are doing that, but this is another story. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Claudio. So uh, now we are diving into the Q&A session, uh, and I would request you to please use the microphone for recording purposes. If there's any question, please go ahead, and we will take one question in person and then one question online. Thanks. Thank you very much, Augustia. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. If I can just add a note regarding the protection aspect that you mentioned, it's um, one of the complications is just the magnitude of the current that, as you mentioned, the other thing is the reactive power injection of the converter, that's gonna affect the protection a lot because the, the phase angle of the current with respect to voltage is gonna change and that's a, that's a different story. So many of these relays, like distance protection, everything should be retuned and redesigned because of that. But can you just uh, elaborate a little bit more on the uh, grid codes that you have for the grid forming inverters in, uh, in the UK? Yes. Uh, well, f first of all, a comment on the protection. So basically, we, we just finished uh, I mean, it's a stage project, it's still going on. There are some papers if you are interested. So we have been working with uh, SSC, that this is the company on the north of Scotland, with uh, seven relay manufacturers, and we have been working with uh, uh, ta -ta -ta -ta, uh, the HVDC center, okay, a research center. And one of the things that we have been looking at is uh, w what's the best signal that we can give to the protections to, 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 to trip, and for example, uh, this was led by a colleague of mine that knows how a protection works. I have absolutely no idea. For me, a protection is just something that gives a signal and opens. And one of the aspects that we have been looking at is 
for example, for distant protection relays, how we can make sure that we are providing the, the best signal from the converter that can trip. And the context of that is that the network that we were looking at, it was an HBDC link connected to an extremely weak network. So basically what this means is that what this converter is doing is not going to be seen from the rest of the network. And one of the things that we have explored is the idea of playing with active, reactive, positive, and negative sequence uh, in order to make sure that we can provide the, the, the best signal to trip the relay. And this is a challenge. It's a, it's a massive challenge. So this is why also I appreciate your comment and uh, Claudio's comment that uh, protection, let's say one thing is how you design the protection. On the other is, can you do something uh, that uh, you can uh, help the, 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 the converter to, 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 can the converter do something to help the protection to trip? And also add on this, we have been working on a revision for a grid code for a Middle East, and it's going to be for a converter-dominated network, large HVDC converters and large stuff, all, all of them interfaced by converters. And for example, when we had to discuss the provision of active and reactive power in case of fault, uh, we prioritize active, uh, because when you are working with converter, it's very likely that you can support the or keep the voltage stable. But one of the things that we have seen is that the RAM rates that the, the network recovers uh, might affect the, the, let's say, the, the, the frequency balancing after the, the fault. And this is something that we, we, we have, uh, we have uh, been looking at. And grid codes in the UK. So what happened is uh, three years ago, four years ago, uh, basically there was the doubt of, uh, let's say, if grid forming had to be uh, market-based or should be grid code-based in the UK. And uh, basically what happens is four years ago, they arrived in a compromised solution uh, on how, uh, what are the minimum of the bare minimum requirements that a grid forming unit should behave in the GB network. And what I should tell you is that I have been involved in the working groups on this, and uh, we finished the second iteration of the grid code last year, and we are going to start the third iteration now. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say here is that it's still ongoing. Uh, and if you look at the very primitive definitions, basically what the document was saying is that the way that we are going to define grid forming is something that behaves like a voltage source and can respond in, in less than five milliseconds like a voltage source behind an impedance. This was the original definition that we provide in the grid code. But there are some questions on how it should be done. So what I can tell you is that this is what the grid code says, and now there is another iteration that it has been uh, put in more context. But this is, uh, I would call it, that this is just a provisional approach, or what Great Britain believes that the grid forming converter is. Uh, I guess we have an online question. Oops. Yeah, we have a question online. Uh, it's from Daniel from Brazilian Energy uh, Engineer. Uh, with the challenge posed by climate change, including strong winds and hail, which can cause significant damage to the solar farms and incur higher replacement cost, is there a plan to incorporate geothermal energy into UK's, UK's energy mix? Geothermal, although more expensive upfront, is reliable and resilient against such extreme weather. Well, I, I mean, I'm not an expert on energy mix and, uh, and generation, but I would argue that the UK strategy is, I mean, geothermal is something that uh, I think, I believe that does not exist in the UK at all, due to the, no, ge no, the geological, uh, or the geology of the country. But uh, where we put our, uh, our X is the basket of the wind power. So basically, in, uh, by 2050, we are going to have uh, 50 gigawatts of offshore wind. We are expecting to, to generate the major part of our power using wind. And uh, also this is going to be distributed across the country to make sure that uh, we have, let's say, if it is not wind in the north, it's at least uh, wind in the south. So uh, I would say that where we put our eggs is uh, in, uh, in uh, wind power, and we are convinced that we can achieve 50 gigawatts by offshore only by the end of 2030. We are already in 20 something. And we believe that the other way to go is uh, nuclear even though every nuclear reactor that we try to build is, is uh, we, we try to build three. One was uh, awarded to the Chinese, and all in a sudden they said that the Chinese, we are not friends anymore, so it was canceled. Uh, the other two, one is an extension that it seems that is going ahead, but with a massive uh, uh, overhead, I know it's overrunning the cost, and the other one is the same. So uh, at, at least we are going with wind so far, and some uh, gas, I assume. Questions? Yeah, hello. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I had a question about the 
uh, so you, you said at the beginning of the talk like well, a lot of these issues may be related to like the fracturing of all of the um, various industries involved. You said like oh there's already three different you know distributors yeah. and there's all of these um, smaller you know regulators and things. Uh, and this was my opinion. Uh, so it doesn't make it okay. Clear. It's not <laughs> sure. Um, so is there any like direction being taken towards like having better cooperation between all of these different industries and things to make me like make sure stability is greater like at a yeah. you know like national level in some sense? Well, uh, I think that this is a, a, an important question. Uh, and basically what we have to understand is that when the system was privatized, uh, basically the stability was something that we knew for ages and uh, it was a uh, mainly, no, it, it, it was not a big issue because we knew how it worked and we know how to study and we know what units we had that could provide it. And basically the GB system ran for this until uh, 2010, that basically is at the moment that the coal started to, to close down, shut down everywhere in the country and all these problems start to arise. So what I would argue is that in fact, the ESO, that is the one, the energy system uh, operator is the one that should take, for example, care of the stability. They were a little bit unaware and they say it took them by surprise. And in fact, what I would argue is that one of the points of bringing uh, the, the, the ownership of the system operator back into public hands is to enhance the, 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 you know, the, the communication among the different partners. Uh, also, what, what I should say is that, uh, I mean, from my, with my hat from a Scottish power, is that I would say, uh, I'm discussing with the people in, from inside, uh, electric companies in the UK, the owners, were uh, probably managed by economists and with people that uh, they were more uh, worried about making a profit uh, rather than operating the network or making sure that uh, uh, the, 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 no, the, the, their bit was, uh, let's say, electrically working. And basically what happens now is that, for example, with the stability issues, they have seen that the, their assets might be in danger. And what you can see is that they are, this is becoming a priority for all of them. And you can see that these people are organizing meetings and going together. And for example, now we have new working groups in, the, in GV working, uh, no, no, that, that, that discussing this. We have seen uh, people are discussing doing uh, faults in the network to understand how the network works. And the last fault that was uh, studied in the network was in 1988. So but what, what I'm trying to say here is that now people are trying to, to work together and try to, to understand how the, how the system is working more or far beyond what uh, an economic uh, profit could be. Or this is at least uh, what I understand from looking at the, at the landscape. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, thank you for the, like, this subject, and uh, welcome to Waterloo, and thanks thank also you. for uh, WISE to organize uh, this meeting. Uh, I remember, like, uh, correct my understanding, like, you, you said about, like, the change that will happen in the future, and I remember, like, one of the change that the setting for the relays, like, will be changed, like, to 0.5, after yeah. that to 1 hertz. I just want to know, like, okay, if we have the, this flexibility to increase, like, this, does that actually like will help and like uh, why it's not like two hertz? Why yeah, it's not yeah, well, uh, I mean, uh, I don't have the answer why uh, uh, 0 0.5 or 1. I, I would argue that it's a little bit of trial and error. Uh, but uh, what, what I would uh, tell you is that a lot, a lot of things, at least is my feeling, a lot of things in the power industry, they were not decided because uh, there was, uh, no, there is a, no, 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 for example, this thing of the relays, the, the loss of main relays, basically were, design, were designed to disconnect an asset when the network disappears. So basically there is a disconnection uh, farther down the line, uh, well, not down the, the whatever substation. So basically it was a protection to, to make sure that we, we, we protect our generation and does not go into overspeed and uh, we, we, keep our, we keep our generation assets safe. Later on what happened? is that uh, we, as, the, as the frequency started to reduce, this protection became important because as the, as the inertia was reducing, the, there were undesired disconnection of units. And this was something that uh, people started to concern. And this is why they started to, to change, the, to change the, 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 the setting. But I remember when people started to discuss about this, about the inertia, they said inertia is important because we have the setting of the relay. And imagine that you have to change all the settings of all the relays in the country that in fact we have done and we have done twice. 
and we call it accelerated program and it, it takes three years anyway let's keep this uh, in another discussion but what, what, what i'm trying to say is that the, the main function of the relay uh, was uh, something completely different and that uh, what, or what does the driver behind changing the setting and i think that we are going to see a lot of things like that that uh, something that we designed for a function now we see that we need to change and the only and we spent some time on that and the only thing that we found that might be relevant that the, let's say in terms of engineering terms might be relevant uh, for a particular uh, rate of change of frequency what we understand is the that the shaft of certain all power stations might have a resonant mode that can be excited if the rock off is very high this is the my understanding of the only reason to keep these protection relays at a particular setting this is what i understood uh, yeah. I assure you, our guest speaker for today will be here for another five, 10 minutes for networking. So if you would like to chat with him on a face-to-face -face basis, that would be a good opportunity. On that note, I would like to thank you, Augusty, for your wonderful presentation and sharing some outstanding insights with us. Thank you so very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for coming.